the Panga people of 90 Mile Beach. Away up north is this big beach, the longest in the land, curving round the coastal reach, a lonely stretch of sand. The ocean rolls thunder in to crash upon the shore, and sand is driven by the wind for several miles or more. And in this bleak and windswept place, some Panga people live, known to those who know that race, for cheek that they can give. The Panga people, so it's claimed, if you should like to know, were here before the Māori came, a thousand years ago. Invisible to human eye, accepting in reflection, the Panga people have survived by dodging our detection. Now sometimes children in the past have said that they could see them running through the marram grass, but no one would believe them. They like to eat their shellfish raw, and sometimes where they dwell, above the high tide on the shore, you'll find some piles of shell. The Punga people, it is said, are crafty little fairies, quite unique as fairies go, and green and quick and hairy. It's hard to tell they're even there, they never leave much sign, and if you don't believe them, well, that suits them just fine. Into this wild environment, some fishing people came. Up and down the beach they went. Surf casting was their game. They threw their lines into the sea with big long fishing rods and often caught a fish or three, a snapper or a cod. Soon others came from all around for sport or recreation, they'd found a brand new playing ground, a clean, unspoiled location. They drove their cars and trucks and bikes along the low tide sand, with all their mess and noise and lights polluting Panga land. Some brought along their picnic hampers, others brought their kites. Some were hikers, some were trampers, Many camped and stayed the night. Others brought along their spades to dig for tohiro, and you could see the holes they made for miles along the shore. Seagulls hovered overhead and mongrels hung about, looking for the scraps of bread that people had thrown out. With glass and plastic bottles, cardboard cans and other stuff, the beach began to look a little like a rubbish dump. The Punga people naturally resented this intrusion and upset their activities by causing great confusion. They tangled up the fishing lines, took things then put them back, put sand in people's sandwiches and hold the shellfish sack. They let down tyres and put out fires and spilt the picnic wine. Collapsed the tents and cut the wires that held the quicksand sign. Cars got bogged where sand was soft, were sometimes even buried because some signs were carried off by certain little fairies. And then folks had some food for thought they couldn't understand. Behind their backs, the fish they'd caught were hidden in the sand. They began to blame each other. There was no one else about. Brothers blamed their brothers, and then arguments broke out. In the end, they packed up early, went off home without a feed. All bad-tempered, cross and surly, from the Panga people's deeds. The Panga people, when they'd gone, dug up the fish they'd buried. They lit a fire to cook them on, and feasted, and made merry. People gave up camping there, soon all the tents were gone, and tales were told of noises queer, and weird things going on. It 
wasn't very long before the local folk were daunted. They didn't go there anymore. They said the beach was haunted. The Punga people celebrated, dancing till the break of day. The thing that they most hated had at last been chased away. The beach became deserted. Hardly any people came. And if the crowds return, they'll soon get plenty of the same. So if you go up 90 mile and want to be alright there, only stay a little while and save yourself a nightmare. <laughs>